Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Digging Deeper Moment number 173. We are so glad that you've joined us. If you haven't already yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please remember to do so, because it really helps us to spread messages like this one to others. Thank you. We've been in a series called The Bible Jesus Used. We've seen that the Hebrew Bible used by Jesus was arranged in three sections, the Torah, the Nevi'im, that's the prophets, and the Kutavim, which is the writings. And that each section has two kinds of literature in them, history and non-history, and that each section is named according to the non-historical writing. Understanding this arrangement clears up some of the confusing things that Jesus and others said in the New Testament. For instance, Jesus says in Matthew 22, 34, He says, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Then on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus says something similar in Luke chapter 11, verses 49 through 51, when he says, Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them, I, some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. That's Jesus' generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. The arrangement of the Christian Bible obscures what Jesus is saying here, but when you read the Jewish Bible, it makes complete sense. The first book of the Jewish Bible is Genesis, and Abel is the first martyr in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. The last book in the Jewish Bible is 2 Chronicles, and the last person martyred in that book was Zechariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 20 through 21. Zechariah was not the last martyr, martyr chronologically. He's just the last in the Hebrew canon. That is the Hebrew Bible, the Bible Jesus used. So Jesus is saying that the blood guilt of the entire world in all of biblical history and in all history, from the creation of the world until 70 AD, would come upon Jerusalem in the first century, and it did. Jerusalem was destroyed like no other city. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 21, For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. There it is again, all the history of the world to this point. And no, no ever, nor ever shall be. There's something else we need to take note about the arrangement of the Hebrew Bible. As we've seen, each of these three sections has two kinds of literature, historical and non-historical. But we need to take note of the fact that the historical books provide a factual account of events, while the non-historical books act as a kind of a commentary on these events. They explain what happened from God's perspective. Dr. Peter Gentry writes, one can see from the arrangement in the Hebrew canon, that would be the list of the books in the Bible, that the first nine books of the Old Testament and the last four are historical or narrative. Sandwiched in between are the non-narrative books that form a commentary on the historical narrative section. So the historical books are mostly narrative. That means they're, they're telling you actual history, and they're telling it in prose, in straight talk. There's not symbolic language. They're not trying to say one thing is representative of another. It's just straight history. Though they do have some poetry in them. But the use of poetry in these historical books is pretty obvious. Even in English, you can tell the writer is using a different genre, a different type of writing. Take, for instance, the book of Judges. It's a historical book. But when it gives the account of the Judge Deborah, it gives both a narrative account, that's a straight prose account of literal history, this is what happened, but it also gives a poetical account. In Judges 4, it gives straight history, and in Judges 5, it gives a poetical rendition of the same events. You might want to check that out for yourself. So chapter 5 then serves as a commentary to further explain chapter 4. But the entire book of Judges is still history. Likewise, the non-historical books are largely poetry, but they also contain some prose or narrative, which means there's still commentary on the historical books, but they have a little bit of narrative, narrative in them, and you can tell that as well. It becomes very obvious when you compare. For example, Isaiah is a non-historical book, which is mostly poetry. When you read Isaiah, you've got to remember you're reading poetry. That means the words there represent something else. They're symbolic. But right in the middle of Isaiah, in chapters 36 through, through 39, you find straight narrative. It's clearly this happened, this happened, then that happened. And it doesn't, it's not being given in symbolic language. And you can clearly see that it's different from the rest of the book of Isaiah. It's obvious. But that doesn't change the fact that Isaiah is a commentary 
for the historical books. In other words, Isaiah is explaining from God's perspective what took place in Israel and why. Now let us begin going through each section of the Jewish Bible to see how each section unfolds and, this, and we'll, at the same time, we'll give a synopsis of each book, and then we'll come back in our next Digging Deeper moment and kind of tie it all together. But I want to kind of start before we leave, because I like to leave some things hanging for repetition's sake so that we can pick it up again next week, and by repeating it, we can learn it a little bit more quickly. So first we have the three sections of the Bible being the Old Testament being the Torah, which contains five historical books. These are historical narratives telling a story of what happened. They include other genres of text, but the idea behind these books is to tell story, to tell facts. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now Genesis gives us the history of the world from the creation of the universe by God to the arrival of the sons of Israel in Egypt. That would be Joseph, Jacob and his 12 uh, sons along with Joseph, and that's in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is followed by the book of Exodus. Now I want you to notice how, how events are continuing to unfold as we read these books. In Exodus, it gives us the history of Israel from the time of Joseph, the son of Jacob, or the son of Israel, because Jacob's name was changed to Israel, to the Exodus out of Egypt under Moses. So you have another time period, but it's much shorter. And it takes us to, the, to Israel's journey to Mount Sinai where they received the Ten Commandments. This is followed by the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is history, but its genre, its type of literature is Torah or law. It's an instruction. It's written in prose. It's not written in symbolic poet poetical language. It's straight talk. It's not poetical, but it contains both historical events and instructions for worship. And it was given right after Israel began to build the tabernacle, or during that year period when they built the tabernacle and Israel was at Mount Sinai. So these are historical events and historical instructions. This is followed by Numbers, which is also history. It gives the history of Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness from Sinai to the Promised Land. So after the tabernacle was built, they got the book of Leviticus to tell them how to worship in it. Now the next book that's given is the book of Numbers, which explains after they left Mount Sinai and began to journey around the desert until they went into the Promised Land. And the book of Numbers is followed by the book of Deuteronomy, and it is also history, but it also has Torah. That's law and instruction. In fact, it's laid out like a suzerain covenant. And most of us don't know what that is, but it's just the way the covenants were made back in the time of Moses. And it's pretty amazing how historically it relates and is structured exactly like one of those covenants. But it records the establishment, or really the reestablishment, of the Mosaic Covenant with the nation of Israel after their 40 years of journeying in the desert, just prior to, the, to Israel entering the Promised Land. Now that's so what we see is the first five books of the, of the Torah are historical. Section 2, the Nevi'im, that's the prophets, has eight books. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the 12 prophets. But I want you to notice that Joshua, which follows Deuteronomy, but Joshua's the first book in the next section, it's actually history. It takes us from the death of Moses before Israel entered the Promised Land to the taking of the land or the Promised Land under Joshua. And at this time, Israel was a theocracy. That meant God was their king. There was no human king. The nation was led by judges. That's a his, the historical book of Joshua. Now Joshua is followed by the book of Judges, and it too gives history. It gives the history from the death of Joshua to the judge Samson. So James, Samson was technically the last judge right before Samuel when there was about to be a change in government. And that's, so that book, Judges, is, so you see there's more history unfolding. And now that book of Judges is followed by Samuel. It too is history, and it takes us from the end of theocracy. That's the nation of Israel. God was their king, but there was no human king, to the beginning of a monarchy under Saul and David. And so God's rule over Israel now changes from being a direct theocracy to what they call a monarchy. Now there's a human king that represents God. And that's a big change. But I want you to notice that the book of Samuel in our Bible, there's two books. In the Jewish Bible, there's one. It's the same content, but it's history. And this is followed by the book of Kings. In our Bible, it's two books of Kings. And it too is history. And it gives us from the time of Saul, who's the, really the, technically the first king in the monarchy, to the end of the monarchy under King Zedekiah. So you can see that the first nine books of the Jewish Bible, the Bible that Jesus used, are clearly historical. They're recording actual events that God wanted His people 
to remember and learn and to learn from. The 10th book, which is the prophetical book of Jeremiah, is actually commentary on the first nine books. But we're out of time, and we'll have to pick it up there next week. If this lesson helped you, please share it with a friend. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or check out our Sunday morning live podcast on either Apple or Spotify. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please take a moment to do this. It will help us greatly, and we thank you. Hope to see you next week.